is uh, tongue dyed. And so uh, thank you, Celia, for joining us uh, today to share a bit of an introduction into uh, what that is and how people might become more familiarized with the opportunity that the tongue gives us to know more about our health. So thank you for what you're going to share. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, for all of your guidance and your, your support with this. And I just a, a love and adore teaching at Imer. And thanks, Stephanie, for helping to pull this all together. It's really a pleasure to be here today with you all. Um, so what I'm going to share today is a technique that we use in East Asian medicine, which is one of four different ways that we approach diagnostics. So we have a differential diagnostic process which is somewhat similar to Western medicine, but we tend to do a lot more in terms of touching and feeling and, and deeper observation. And one of the ways we do that is by observing the tongue. So I'm going to present today a little bit of science so that you know the underpinnings of what we're gonna do. Um, and then we're gonna go through a couple of examples of tongue, tongues so that we can see them together and get an idea of what East Asian medicine would be looking at and why we would be considering it as part of a diagnosis. And then we're gonna look at your tongues or you're gonna look at your tongues and you're gonna come back and tell, tell us what you see or what kind of questions you might have, um, what you find when you're looking at it. I think, I hope it'll be eye-opening as much as it is tasty. I know I had to say it, I just had to say it, I apologize. All right, I'm gonna share my screen because of course they have a presentation because it's, it's impossible to share all the different tongues that we might find normally as in a clinical practice, but I'm gonna make, I'm gonna give a try. So, sorry, um, you can see my, my screen okay? Yes, looks good. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to move into the presentation phase, hopefully. Oh, there we go. All right, so what does your tongue say about you? There are many ways of considering the tongue. Um, and so part of this is, for us, is we're considering um, how to move forward the slides. It depends on who says, who's saying it who's actually asking you to consider the tongue. So Western medicine and Eastern medicine have different ways of considering it. And part of it is, um, oh, oh yeah, I apologize, there is some technology. Gosh, Stephanie, maybe you should drive, but um, I'll try it for now. Um, Western medicine, for example, this is, a, this is a photo and a description on the left-hand side of a flyer that went out through Banner, Univer Banner um, System in Tucson, Arizona. And it was taken in part from an article that was written, I believe, in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago. And what it does is that it defines the tongue uh, mostly through Western eyes. So it looks at, this is the, the photo that was part of the flyer. And it looks, at, um, it, it, it looks at the tongue and it says that scalloped edges or the indented teeth um, is normal. And in East Asian medicine, we think that it may be common, but this kind of a feature on the tongue is not normal. Painful bumps or ulcers are on the tongue can be due to biting, smoking, canker sores, oral cancer, true, all of that. In East Asian medicine, we also think about it as how these, ex, these internal conditions are being reflected on the tongue itself. And so we're looking at things like temperature imbalances within, within internally within yourself, digestion, metabolic issues, any one of which can be caused by a diet, lifestyle, cancers, or other, other issues that could be happening inside. Um, but it's, one, it's a glimpse at what's happening inside of the body. Western medicine says that red or white bumps um, may represent an early or advanced tongue cancer. That's true. It also, for us, represents an internal imbalance that is oftentimes lodged within digestive issues and metabolic issues, may indicate Western symptom, West, Western diagnoses of cancer, but it also represents things that can be corrected and changed in lifestyle and diet and approach sleep, things um, reducing anxiety, reducing stress, things that are easy and common for us to be able to have control over, should we just know what to do about it. So tongue diagnosis talks in East Asian medicine, um, we talk about how the tongue is actually an entry point for the stomach and the spleen meridian. 
And it's also an exit for the heart meridian. So I'm not even gonna go into detail about any of this, but in the Western side of what they see the tongue as is an opening to the whole alimentary system. So um, we also think about it as a muscle. It's true for both Eastern and Western. It's a fact that the tongue is a muscle and it's controlled and innervated by blood flow and nerve endings. Um, we think of it in East Asian medicine as it's supplied by blood and chi. And the tongue also in Western medicine has mucous membranes, uh, the epithelial layers that are important um, for uh, barriers to some infections, but also contributors to moisture. Those barriers, that membrane level, the tongue coating, the moisture represents patterns of, of in, that, that are operating within our bodies. And so we look at those patterns and we start to put together a diagnosis. Taste buds are very important for both Eastern and Western, but they also for us begin this transformative process of the alchemical process of changing food and, and liquid into dietary and energy. So there were things that we look for. We look for the condition, the overall condition of the tongue. What's the color? What's the shape? What are the landmarks on the tongue? We look for whether or not the tongue actually has spirit or vitality. And we look for color and moisture and quality and quality of the moisture and the quality of the tongue. So I don't know if you've ever had a chance to, to observe many tongues out there, but when you do, it's interesting to see that almost every tongue has a different story. And those stories are rep represent the internal operation of the human body and, and really of the spirit and the level of vitality and life force that we have. And some of that is displayed by how somebody puts out their tongue. So we're gonna get into that next. Tongue is a muscle. These are the facts. Tongue's a muscle. It's moistened by saliva. It has a right and left side that is separated by the lingual septum, which you can see underneath the tongue. And we'll take a look at that later. Um, it's a blood supply. It has a nerve supply. It has a mucosal layer. And um, once again, the, the condition of the tongue is often seen by, um, it's often representative by what is happening inside the body. Tongue should be supple, not flabby, not stiff, not many cracks, neither swollen or thin. It fits inside your mouth. There are no ulcers or other really significant landmarks and it does not move involuntarily when it's extended. This is just some science about it, just gives you a picture of what Western, how the Western science would be doing a diagnosis, doing a kind of a, um, if they were going to be going into the, uh, the complete examination, this is what your, your dentists look at. This is sometimes what your doctors look at when they're, when they're peering inside your mouth. And here are some very simple photos that represent a normal tongue, fairly normal tongue. I'm going to take a break right now. Um, and I want, I want to see where we are. I want to see how you are faring with all of this. I'd like to see if you want to put out, anybody wants to put out your tongue. I'll put out mine. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right. Oh, perfect. Okay, so, so oh, excellent. this is so great. <laughs> perfect. Okay. All right. So did you all notice that there are different ways of putting out the tongue, right? Sometimes you can put it out like a two-year-old, which is like, right? And that's a real, so imagine that you're sticking out this muscle, because that's basically what you're doing, is that you've got this muscle of, that's the tongue. And so when you stick it out, it can change shape. I mean, how many of you can curl your tongue inside? Right? It's, right? it's hard. It's actually kind of hard to do, but some of us have that skill set. Some of us have the genetics that allow the tongue that's wide enough and actually has the, the lingual septum loose enough that you can curl your tongue around. So just be imagining for the next couple of minutes, you don't have to show yourself, but for the next couple of minutes, experiment with putting out your tongue. And I'm gonna show you what it actually means, the way you put it out, the way you kind of place it and how and what you see on it. I'm gonna go back and start sharing my screen again because now that you've actually looked at it and we've all looked at some of your tongues, um, we, can, we can start to like really analyze what we're seeing. Okay. The reason why these are fairly normal tongues is that the color is good. 
There was moisture on this tongue. There aren't very many landmarks when you look at this tongue. So it's not too wide. They're not too wide, although the one on the right side of the page is a little bit wider than the mouth, but they're not too thick, right? Um, there aren't many indentations on these tongues. So these are fairly normal and I'd say fairly, fairly healthy tongues. So the tongue is, has vascularization. Um, there is the external carotid artery that feeds into the lingual artery and blah, blah. I'm not going to go into details here, but I want to make sure that you understand that whenever you move your tongue, as because it's a muscle, you are act activating both blood and so vasculation um, and as well as nerves. So you are actually actively moving a muscle and that muscle will change as you move it. So how do you examine the tongue? We just looked at a couple of different tongues. And what we're gonna do now is consider that the picture on the left-hand side was taken exactly 10 seconds before the picture on the right side. So this is one of my patients. And what he did, he's, he's an athletic trainer actually. And what he did, which is what a lot of athletic trainers do is they stick at the tongue like it's a muscle, right? And that in itself actually restricts blood flow and it restricts nerve. So it, it can flatten the tongue, it can make the tongue look unusual, and it gives a very different diagnostic perspective than the tongue that you see on the right side of the page. On the right side of the page, what I did is I instructed him to just open his mouth, just very open the mouth, um, extend the tongue, you only put it out for up to eight seconds, you have to ask the person or ask yourself, you know, have you had coffee, tea, candy, medications, a glass of red wine anytime in the last 12 hours? Do you brush your tongue in the morning? All of that will impact the, the color of the tongue coat and the thickness of the tongue coat and the moisture of the tongue coat. If you happen to be doing this for you're looking at somebody else because you want to make a slight diagnostic with it, um, you have to just be aware of where your eyes are in relationship to that person's mouth. Yes, you have to stoop down a bit. And yes, you have to look into the mouth. You can use a flashlight or your phone just to, so you can see into the back end of the mouth, towards the root of the mouth. So here's what we're looking at. And this is a, a East Asian medicine perspective of what you see, the map that you see when you look, when you can look at the tongue and look at the different organs. And so luckily this has actually been mapped out using a geographic information system, GIS system mapping of the tongue. They, um, the science has really evolved so that we can now basically look at the tongue with LED lights in a computerized um, standard format that then dissects the, the tongue just like we would dissect the earth. And we can see the features in the tongue, the thickness, the, the moisture, and all of that gets literally put into computers. And we now have databases of hundreds of thousands of tongues that have been um, computer assisted diagnosed, um, dissected, that we can say with very little um, hesitation now that certain features on a tongue are going to actually re be replicated within Western medicine. So let's look at these features. Let's look at this map. And you can see that the tip of the tongue is where we might consider the, ha the heart and the lung, the, the health of the heart and the lung. Um, the sides are the livers and the gall liver and gallbladder. The middle of the tongue is the spleen and the stomach. And the back of the tongue are the kidneys, the bladders, and the intestines. So this is, gives you some topography. So when you go to look at the tongue, and I'm going to show you a, um, a slide next of a lot of different tongues that show up in my clinical practice in the United States. And I say that because in different countries, because of diet and lifestyle, tongues appear, can appear differently um, based on, again, also the size of the mouth, but also what's the diet? What are they drinking? Um, how are they living? What's their stress level? So um, these tongues are from my practice. They represent female and male. They represent ages between 35 and 75. And you can see kind of the wear and tear of a body on this tongue. They look very different than that, those photos of the normal tongues that I showed you. So things that we want to look at are, are there deep cracks in the tongue? Are there different colors? Are there different bumps? Are there different um, features in the length of the tongue? Or is there an indentation towards the tip of the tongue as you see in these two photos? How dark color red is it? How light is it? This is all gonna tell you some information even about yourself. If we go back to this idea of the tongue 
um, the map of the tongue, you can see that certain features might actually tell you about how well certain parts of your system might be working. Now, we never use this as a sole diagnostic technique in East Asian medicine. It always is accompanied by other symptoms and signs that we go back and we verify from one to the other. So like, for example, if I'm looking at um, this tongue on this, on this page, the person, um, let's just say this person that looks like Santa Claus tongue on the very bottom with all the, with all the mustache and the beard. Um, this is a very thin tongue. There's not a lot of moisture. It doesn't have a lot of, um, a lot of plumpness to it. So just like you would think in a muscle, the tongue is not very well hydrated. Why is that? I'd have to go and ask other questions about uh, to this person. It's a red tongue, which means that it's kind of hot. Red is hot. Um, pale is cold. So I know that this person actually does run. His body runs really hot. He sweats a lot. Therefore, he's dehydrated. Um, you see uh, some other features on the tongue as well. So I would always be going backwards. I'd be taking his pulse. I'd be asking other things about digestion, about his emotional status, about um, how he is sleeping at night. A lot of other things would take me on a course to, to provide actually a differential diagnosis. So as, as we noted, examining the tongue is not as easy as it seems. It just extending the tongue can bring you a different view. So the, I usually tell my patients, just envision a panting dog, because then the muscles, the jaw muscles relax, and almost automatically the muscle of the tongue um, and the ligaments, the, the, the ligaments are actually going to relax a little bit too, so that you're not forcing your tongue out like a two-year-old having a temper tantrum. Instead, you're kind of opening your mouth and you're panting like a dog, not necessarily a lizard, but like a dog. So that's Colette, that's perfect. Um, so you, like, literally you drop your jaw, you keep your tongue relaxed and you put it out. So it's about like you place it out. Perfect. And then you only keep it at eight to 10 seconds because by that point, you're going to have already adjusted the muscle, the blood flow, the nerve to it, and it's going to dry, start to dry out. Um, so this is what I have. I'm going to, um, I want to go back to this photo right before we start sticking tongues out at each other. Um, and, and take a look at this so that you have it in your mind about where you might see on your own tongue. And then um, moving out to um, sticking it out. I'm going to stop sharing because I want to see all of your lovely tongues. And let's see. Let's see what we have. Oh, McBed, you're, you're perfect because you're right up there on the camera. That's just, <laughs> that's perfect. Don't lick the camera. That's bad. Um, <laughs> all right. Great. So what do you guys see? You can see yourself, right? You can, you can, you have an idea of what you're looking at. Who wants to share? We'll give you a few minutes to share. What do you see? Or what do you see in somebody else? What do you see in my tongue? Yours looks so much better than mine. <laughs> you have a nice tongue doctor it's a little dry i have to say it's a little dry i'm a little nervous so it's a little dry talking i have these funny marks is this susan uh-huh we all have funny marks of one way or the other but okay all right i used to yours i'm not going to look up close because i don't have that ability right now but um right. but it doesn't look that bad Oh, all right. I can't, I can't really go into diagnosis right, right, right now, yeah. but you're welcome to contact me afterwards if you want to, and, and I'm, I'm happy to lend a hand. Um, okay. You know, somebody asked up in the chat that, the, that one of those tongues, two of those tongues actually had a divot in the very middle. And yes, the, the lingual fr uh, frenulum may be restricted. So here's an interesting thing. One of the people I work with um, actually had a short tongue at birth. And they wanted to cut the lingam, and her parents refused to let her, let them. So she actually now talks normally, but what her parents did was change her diet. So we think in, China, in East Asian medicine that the, that, the ling, um, that the ligaments and the tendons are controlled by moisture and, and metabolism and diet. 
Um, so the more moisture you add to the body, sometimes you get a lot more spit and, and obviously saliva, but it actually moistens the, the ligament and how it can stretch a little bit. Um, and I know that sounds a little crazy, but um, people that tend to be dehydrated tend to be a little bit more tongue tied like I am right now. Um, so just think about how moisture affects the body and the use of a tongue. All right. Does having deep indentations on your tongue make you a better singer? Because I have always noticed this, that I was I was terribly ashamed of my my, my tongue because I've got great big indentations in them in it. And the indentations are on the side. No, they're sort of in, <laughs> <laughs> in the middle towards the front. Probably, uh, I think that's the heart area. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, if you think about that, the heart, uh, what, what we say in China and also in East Asian medicine is that the heart meridian actually exit ends at the tongue, at the base of the tongue. And so people that are um, able to express their hearts um, and express themselves, whether through words or through song, you can easily express yourself means that there's like this freedom in the heart. And that's just one kind of esoteric way of thinking about it. But what I do know is that people that go into shock for any reason, people who are in trauma or who are in shock, and this has happened to myself a few times when I've gone into shock, is you can barely talk, right? You, can, you, 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 you can't get out a word, which tells me that what happens is that this, this meridian that goes from my heart, which is in shock and trauma, something has just happened to me and it ends at my tongue that somehow it's constricted, right? It's like pulled down and suddenly I can't, I can't talk. So um, there are these, re these rationales in the East Asian medicine in particular that look at how um, the meridians that are connected to the tongue and that includes the stomach and the spleen and the liver goes on both sides of the tongue on the internal pathway that it really does have a measure. It does give us a measure of the health of the body inside. It's interesting you mentioned the sides of my tongue because I like have a mirror here and I'm like looking closely and I notice that the sides of my tongue are more, I don't know, I would say like white with like patches and my acupuncturist is always telling me like, I need to purge my liver. I need to like from my liver. I need to do stuff with my liver. And then you mentioned the meridians. I'm like, wow, that's so interesting that that's like what I'm manifesting. And then too, like you're asking about like what we notice, I think about your tongue. And I think probably the most obvious thing for people is like the color and mm -hmm. yours looked so much, I would say more red than mm -hmm. most of the ones that I've kind of observed. Like a lot of people have like this white coating on mm -hmm. more so than that kind of plump redness, which I think is indicative more of like a healthier, kind of more open mm -hmm. meridian situation. Well, the, it's good that you brought up the tongue coating. I have a picture that a couple of pictures that I took out of the presentation, um, but they're very, you can see very thick coats on even on Americans. Um, and, it, and the coating um, really depicts metabolism and digestion. So the thicker the coat, um, the, the worse, basically, the digestion is and their body's ability to metabolize uh, nutrients. So the white coat um, is, means that there's kind of a cold pathogen, something that co cold is happening in their digestive tract, and the yellow coat means heat. So you would be looking at like questions you might want to ask somebody is, do you feel hot a lot or, or uh, frequently? Do you have night sweats? Do you have day sweats? Whenever you see something on the inside of the tongue or the center part of the tongue and on the sides, you definitely want to ask about digestion. How is your digestion? Um, do you have any gallstones? You know, you know things like that. Um, how is, how do, you, do you belch a lot? Things, things that can really give you some ideas about what else you might want to track down both with yourself and your best friends and family. So you have to be careful about this because um, if you ask someone to show you your tongue, their tongue, it's a very intimate space. So, you know, you have to be really careful about that first. And second, you do not want to be the pariah of your family's meals. 
So when you are celebrating food with your family, please do not like try to diagnose their tongues in front of them. You will never be invited back. This is personal experience. So just be, just be cautious of how you use this information. What about time of day? Like when you look at the tongue? Right. So the ideally first thing in the morning when you wake up, because your, your body hasn't had the chance to hide things that are happening inside. So ideally, um, we would look at the tongue first thing in the morning before anyone even has a chance to brush their tongue, to brush their teeth or scrape their tongue. We want to see what the body has done overnight with the material that it had, because we know that liver and gallbladder are very active at night, trying to digest both your internal process um, which are the, the foods and the liquids, um, but also they need to rest a bit. They, they need to have some time off, but there's also this place where the body is digesting life. It's digesting the experiences of the day before. So um, people who have tongue in the morning that are bright red, or maybe have a thick coat on it, I would be asking them about what was the, what was the day before like for you, emotionally, physically, and otherwise. I'll go ahead and this is Stephanie. Thank you so much, Celia. I'll go ahead since we're getting some questions in the chat and some out loud. Let's move all your questions to chat. It's officially Q&A time right now. And uh, Celia, I'll start us off with a couple. Um, is there a good atlas for tongue diagnosis? Um, there is. And I have that in a handout. Do you want me to put the handout up? Yeah, that's great. We can also include it in the recording email that okay. everyone will receive. Um, okay. Do you recommend tongue scraping? Um, you know, I know that it is very good for bacteria, clearing up bacteria. Um, and so I don't say that I would recommend or not recommend it. I just know, um, it, the, it, we call it the fur, the fur grows back. It, so you can scrape it and get rid of the bacteria and kind of clean off the tongue, but it's, it's going to come back depending on what your digestive health is like. Next question. What about people who have a wandering tongue? How would you diagnose it? Is you're talking about um, physically, like one a tongue that kind of goes from side to side? Now, I'm not asked sure. That. The question was asked, Leslie. Do you want to unmute and maybe give some more information? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for having this presentation. Um, okay. I have a cousin who is 13 years old. And I took her to the doctor and she had some like squiggly lines on her tongue and they seemed to move about at, during certain parts of the day. And the doctor diagnosed her as having a wandering tongue. Okay. Um, which is a really, I was, I was kind of curious about, do you mean like emotionally wandering? Does it just, does she talk a lot um, or is it physically moving? So in, in East Asian medicine, we come back to the idea of, um, a, a, a longer story, but um, you, the tongue should be stable by nerves and by muscle. So something that is that is moving and switching around, even tremors and, and um, tremors, hand tremors or head tremors, um, we might consider that to be an issue with the liver. And so um, the liver has to be able to maintain the uh, kind of the right structure, the right movement, the smooth movement of energy through the body. That's the job of the liver. And so we see in people that have long time drug and alcohol misuse, a lot of times they do have tremors. And that's one of the ways that we, we also go back to looking at what's the function of the liver. I would, I would be really curious about um, getting an enzyme panel. Um, and a whole, you know, a digestive workup on somebody looking at how they digest their, their foods, um, how well they work with um, different liquids and what the liver, what the load is on the liver for um, its ability to filter blood and move, kind of move toxins out. Thank you. Clara asks, how about geographic tongue? Mm. So geographic tongue is a really good snapshot of what's happening in the body at what parts of the body, right? So um, it means that part of the body, especially if there's a thick coat in one area and a thin coat or no coat in the other, I would be looking at what is the, um, what's the moisture. It is true. It's an odd thing, but in East Asian medicine, we really do see that um, a part of the body can be dry while another part of the body can be moist. And that's an internal process that we look at through the chi and, and the blood, how the blood is flowing to a body part 
Is there any restriction in that body part? You know, think of what's the temperature of that body part because blood flows through every organ. So I, I would be really interested in looking at that map of the tongue and see what has a thick coat and what has a thinner coat. Susan asks, what do cracks mean? Cracks always mean dryness. And it, you can have a long crack in the tongue, which is a constitutional, we call it a constitutional crack. Um, it would be really interesting to look at children and to see how they have, what cracks they might have in their tongue after they're born, and even in the first year, second year of life, because this constitutional crack to us represents a lack of chi, a lack of energy in that part of the body. And so if it's a, it's a, if it's a long crack, a long midline crack, and it's very deep, like one of those photos, um, I really have to think about somebody's vitality, their energy, their ability to get through a day, their ability to, to digest food. So the cracks look on the map that you have of the tongue and see where the, those cracks might show up. Great, thank you. Um, what about a tongue that shows scallop marks from teeth at the edge? My tongue does that too. So I'm very interested in this question. Um, you know, there's, there's different reasons for it. Um, so one thing to think about is, why would you have a tongue that's so big that it has that it has to butt up against your teeth, right? A normal tongue doesn't. So just like in terms of a critical thinking process, um, what is making the tongue body, which is a muscle, swollen? Mm -hmm. So how does the tongue get bigger than the mouth so that it butts up against the teeth? And then you start looking at, I mean, for us, simplistically, we would say liver gallbladder issues, which has goes back to digestive, digestive enzymes and it's kind of that smooth flow of chi. So we would look at that, but I would also be looking at how's your stomach working? Because if, you're, if, you're, if that muscle is swollen, um, then what is the stomach doing for digestion? Why is that swollen like that? And how, how, are, you trans, how are you able to transform and actually use moisture in your body, fluids? Very interesting. Another one, I have read that the central line of the tongue corresponds to the spine. Could you elaborate? Um, the central part of the tongue corresponding to the spine, just as I said there, it was, it's the midline crack. Um, and if you think of the window that I showed you, I can go back and show you. You can see where it would almost be the center of the body, but we don't technically think of it as the midline, as, as the spine. What other symptoms go along with a moist tongue? Um, well, if it's an over moist tongue, um, I'm actually putting something into the, I apologize, I'm putting something into the chat because I realized that my, um, the article that I uploaded or the documents that I uploaded does not have um, this resource in it. And I apologize. I thought I had put it in there. The Tongue Atlas by Barbara Kirschbaum is a really good book. Um, so if you are a clinician and you want to take a look at how to look at the tongue and also compare it to Western diagnosis. She has a really good um, method. She, she has photos and she has Western and Eastern diagnoses. So that's a really good book to get. Um, uh oh, you have to ask that no, question again. No, you're okay. What other symptoms go along with a moist tongue? So if it's over moist, again, I have to think about metabolism. Like why, why is the body not able to use the, the liquids that, that you ingest, what, what, what mechanism is impeded? So we think about the tongue, the stomach and the spleen being critical to the process of digestion. And the spleen is in charge of transforming food into usable energy. So I would be looking at um, the stomach for sure, how it's operating, but also the, just the energy, not necessarily the function, the Western function of the spleen, but the Eastern approach to how the spleen is doing its job. And then that takes me back to kidney function. And what, what are the kidneys doing? They should be able to help um, transform the water, to utilize the water that's coming through the urinary bladder, in fact, um, and turn that into energy in the body. So if they're not working well, you can likely have a lot of moisture on the tongue. And then there's that kind of greasy moisture, which has to do more with digestion. Um, there's the moisture that, you know, sometimes when people open their mouth, they have kind of hanging um, phlegm. That's definitely an issue to do with the stomach and with the spleen. 
um, because it, again, there's a transformation, this alchemical process of turning food and liquid into energy is not working. Okay, I'm gonna try to combine a couple different comments and a question into one. So we'll see how I do with that. Um, this one's from Barbara. I can't stick out my tongue bar because under my tongue was clipped, but it grew back. I've had digestive issues and no gallbladder for eight years. I have spilled gallstones that form up a lump in my back that had been removed six years ago, but still have digestive issues. And then to add on to where the question is, Carolyn asked, does the bottom of your tongue have significance? Okay. Um, you mean as in the, the underside of the tongue and the sublingual veins? Yes, that has significance. Um, and that's the easier one to answer. That's why I'm going there first. Um, so when we think about, again, when you think about the top of the tongue, when you, can, can I switch over and show you back over the screen really fast? Oh, go for okay. it. All right. Okay, so when we're at when we're at this picture here, um, the bottom of the tongue, when you're looking at the sublingual veins, will show you the same pattern. So the bottom of the tongue near the root is going to be showing you the kidney, the bladder, the intestines. The middle part of the tongue is the spleen and the stomach, even underneath. And then the top, the tip of the tongue is the lung and the heart. So when you're looking at the sublingual veins, um, if there, I've, I've seen a lot of people, especially people who are in pain, have really engorged sublingual veins. So I have to look at where, it, where are they engorged? Is it the top part, the middle part, or the bottom part of the body? And then that's, that's diagnostic for me. It tells me that there is stagnation there. And I know in the past, I haven't myself done this, but one of my colleagues um, who lived in China for quite a while, um, would actually bleed the sublingual veins to give people release from pain in their backs mostly. And she would also bleed at the very bottom. She would pick up the, um, is this too much information? <laughs> the, the, the tongue and bleed, and bleed into the bottom for people that were um, tongue tied, but also um, who had aphasia from strokes. So she would help release the tuck, but going back to the fact that the tongue is a muscle and that the, um, the ligaments are holding the muscle in place, either too strong or too weak, by, by actually needling into it, you can help relax and release the ligaments so that the muscle can actually breathe a little bit more and get better blood flow. Thank you so much. 